it's a great pleasure to be here on International Women's Day. And um, I was thinking as I was preparing to speak, you know, growing up in a military organization with over 40 years service, you would sense that it's probably not the best place to develop a perspective in terms of the role of women, the importance of gender inequality, and the significance of diversity and inclusion. Because in reality, only until very recently, um, we haven't had those issues on our agenda. And for me, it was a challenge in terms of trying to find the narrative to actually understand why these were so important. And I'll come back to that, because I had an experience about 10 years ago, but really made sense. As Deirdre said, I got it one day, and it was really a eureka moment. But I have that 40 years with service in Afghanistan, in service in Lebanon, in fact, um, the first time I met Deirdre was on the, the blue line when she was in charge of nearly 30 male troops up beside one of those barrels there that Mick Beery um, was showing on his video. Um, in fact, this time last year, the operational commander of our unit on the Golan Heights was a female, Mary Carroll, Lieutenant Colonel Mary Carroll. So for many years, the Irish Defence Forces had been advocating for greater gender balance in our defence forces. And we need more women in our defense forces, not just for peacekeeping. We need more women in our defense forces for everything. Not just to be politically correct. Not just because it gives us access to an extra 50% of the population. Not just because one of the biggest challenges we face, and you mentioned it, was the increase in sexual exploitation and abuse and gender-based violence, which is the, the main effort if not a key supporting effort in many conflicts we see internationally. And the reality is we see that where there is a gender gap, the likelihood of interstate and interstate violence is really high. When you see fragile states, inevitably when you look at gender gap, you will see an association. We need more women in our defense forces because the evidence is overwhelming. Greater gender balance in our militaries gives us better decision making. Greater gender balance in our organizations makes us healthier reflections of the society that we defend, protect, and serve. But from my own perspective, looking at it in the context of peacekeepers and women peacekeepers in the context of 1325 is to some degree like a doctor who is trying to treat an illness by just looking at the symptoms. I think there's a much broader issue here that we need to consider. Women, gender inequality, and diversity and inclusion, and a move towards a better realization in the future is a societal issue and not just a military issue. For many years, the Irish Defence Forces have been endeavoring to recruit more women. We've had a campaign last year which increased our numbers by 50%. But coming from such a low base, it didn't really reflect the effort that we had put into it. And when I looked at it and examined, why is this happening? The simple reality is a point that Deirdre referred to. The stereotyping, the unconscious stereotyping of girls for cer certain roles, such as caregivers, and not going forward for roles in science, technology, engineering, maths, and military. And the converse is true for males, who are stereotyped for other roles. And when we look at it, and we try and see where the gatekeepers are, we see them in the context of career guidance counsellors who are not advocating for roles in the military. Because in reality, if we're going to get more peacekeepers to serve overseas in our peacekeeping missions, one of the main avenues is to come through the military itself. But the other gatekeepers are parents, mammies and daddies, who are not advocating for girls to join the defence forces or the militaries. And that's a challenge for me. And that's why I'm advocating for the point that we need to raise the argument to a societal level to address the challenges that we face. There is another aspect as well, and it's important to consider. I recently was asked to talk at an industry uh, forum, an industry umbrella group that represented over 100 and 40,000 employees in Ireland. 92% of that organization were male, 8% were female. So I 
reviewed my notes. I prepared to come and talk to all these CEOs who I expected to be predominantly male. But imagine my surprise when 100% of the audience was female. Women get it. I'm not too sure about men. And perhaps the most exciting thing of that day was a tweet that went out with the question, Mark Mellet asks, where are all the men? Because in male-dominated organizations, women and the role of women, gender equality, diversity and inclusion are as much male issues as they are female issues. My eureka moment came about 10 years ago. I was part of a research group where we established an innovation partnership between academia, between the military, between civil society, and entrepreneurs, enterprise. And I learned a number of lessons that have stayed with me to this day. First of all, the greater diversity in the groups that we assembled in that partnership, the more disruptive were the outcomes in a positive sense. Mixing science, technology, engineering, and maths with humanities, with men and women, with soldiers, with sailors, with entrepreneurs, with women PhDs, the outcomes were extraordinary. The second thing I learned was, very often the impediment to partnership was egos. And these egos often were leaders, precious egos, who didn't want their culture interfered with, their authority undermined. Ego is the enemy, because empathy is the kingmaker, the ability to bring together disparate groups to actually give better outcomes. The third point I learned was, the overwhelming evidence that when you had gender balance in the groups, the outcomes were inevitably better than single-sex groups who were working on complex problems. So I took these challenges away. At the time, I was head of the Navy, and I started looking at the Navy. And guess what? I found a few egos. I found lots of silos. I found very few women. And people didn't know what diversity was. So my debate started then, and since then, I've looked at it from two perspectives. Firstly, in terms of internal to defense forces itself, and how can we make changes to improve the, the progression in gender, gender balance? And secondly, externally, how can we look at it strategically to have this societal change? Because it's not just a military issue. So internally within the defense forces, we are recruiting more women. We're making good progress. We have captured our third national action plan for women, peace, and security, and we will publish that later this year. We are looking at breaking down silos within the organization, and there is very good progress on that. We have our gender advisors and our gender focal points within the organization. And by the way, my gender advisor is a male, because in a male domination organization, Gender equality is as much a male issue as it is a female issue. Looking externally, we've also looked at the challenges. And one of the lessons I've learned, and, and it's coming home to roost in the context of the sexual exploitation and abuse and gender-based violence, that inevitably, where the challenges are greatest, it is a human issue. And the paradigm is shifting from a focus on st security about states to security about women. And the lesson for us in our defense forces is, we need to move from an organization that traditionally looked at our contribution in international peace and security from a fighting perspective to a conflict resolution perspective, where we look with other, work with other actors, whether it be NGOs, whether it be other parts of society in terms of other governments, where we into, bring in the interim government arrangements, where we go in an integrated approach to find that resolution. And in that context, the second lesson is an understanding that women in peacekeeping are not just one homogenous group. They come in all shapes and sizes. They spread across the continuum from the searing heat of conflict to the serenity of civil society requires all kinds of inputs. And women can be enablers and force multipliers in that context. And the final point in the context of the, the lessons from international is that we must endeavor to look at how we can shape, at a strategic level, the, the matter of a societal change for um, gender inequality overall. We all are working on our national action plans in the context of peace and security. But Wilson said, 
We are drowning in information while starving for knowledge. Information and knowledge drives understanding, but the bridge between understanding and wisdom is values. Knowledge and understanding that doesn't normalize values tends to have populism and unilateralism. Knowledge and understanding that bridges with values achieves wisdom, and wisdom is the underpin of multilateralism. So the national action plans that we work with in terms of women, peace and security need to be nested with those remarkable 17 sustainable development goals that have been crafted. We've moved from a position where the millennium goals were for some, the sustainable development goals are for everyone. And we need to ensure that goal number five, which is about gender equality and opportunity for women and girls, is nested across all the other 16 goals in a manner that makes a difference. The philosopher Mary Parker Follett said, leadership is not defined by an exercise of power, but by the capacity to increase the sense of power in others. Leadership is about creating other leaders. So if I leave you one message, let's all join together to create more leaders who understand the importance of gender equality, women and peace security, who understand the importance of diversity and inclusion, and have both the wisdom and the resolve to make a difference. Thank you very much.